to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Apostle Paul encouraged the young man Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. We welcome you today to our study of the word of God. In this series of lessons, we've been looking at Bible questions and answers that have been submitted by our viewers. And so we're going to the Word of God with these questions to give a, Thus saith the Lord, what is the answer from the Word of God? We're so glad that you've joined us today. Especially want you to know that these lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. Those members of the Lord's body in your area would love for you to sit down and study with them. They'd love for you to stop by their assembly. And as always, if we can help you at the Gospel of Christ in any way, please let us know. Visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and you'll find a host of Bible study materials. And if you'd like to submit a question to be answered on our program, you can do that in a couple of ways. You can email us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can visit our website thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and we have a form that you can fill out and those will be submitted to us to answer on our program. Let's now direct our attention to the questions that we have remaining to answer today. The first question is this. One of our viewers writes in, As a very young child, I was baptized into the Lord's church. The only problem is I don't really know if I understood why and if I was mature enough to be baptized. Should I be rebaptized? A friend, as we think about this, this is probably a question that a lot of people have thought about, especially as you mature, as you understand things, and as you get a little older. And so we want to address this from several different avenues. Number one, the Bible teaches that you do have to know and understand to be saved, right? Jesus said in John 8 verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I've got to hear God's Word, Romans 10, 17, to produce faith, Hebrews 11, 6, which is essential. If I'm not sure about what I knew, then we've got a big problem right there. If I didn't know, uh, that I had to hear the Word of God, if I didn't know that I had to repent of sin or didn't really understand that, if I didn't know that I need to confess Jesus as Savior, or if I didn't know why I was baptized or for what purpose, I just did it because others were doing it, then friend, you didn't really understand what you were doing. And Jesus said, you've got to know the truth for the truth to make you free. And so if one didn't understand what they were doing, and now that person does, you need to obey what you know because now you understand and you know the gospel uh, correctly. Now, what about if a person wasn't mature enough? Sometimes you see especially very young kids uh, who may not really fully understand what they're doing, the commitment that they're making, the maturity that it requires. Do I understand that I'm making a lifelong commitment to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Do I really understand that I'm committing to follow Christ 100% every day? Luke 9 verse 23, do I have the maturity to be in that type of relationship that the Bible likens in Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 as a marriage to the Lord? Am I ready to live up to that bargain? And so if the maturity wasn't there, you didn't really understand, you didn't know what you were committing to, then one does need to be baptized correctly for the remission of sins. Now, the idea of rebaptism, however, is kind of a misnomer. There is no such thing in the Bible as rebaptism. For example, if when I was young I obeyed the gospel, I understood what I was doing, but now someone says, I feel like I've fallen away and I need to be rebaptized. Well, you don't find that in the Bible. 
There is one baptism, Ephesians 4, verse 4 following. If a person was baptized correctly, then he doesn't need to be baptized again. But if he wasn't baptized correctly, he needs to be baptized for the remission of sins and submit to that one baptism that is found in Ephesians 4, verse 4 following. And so here's what we would encourage people to think about. Think about, you're the only person who can answer this, but you think about it to yourself. Did I really understand what I was doing? Did I do it maybe because a brother or sister did? Did I do it for reasons other than what the Scripture teaches? Maybe I wanted to be like everybody else. Uh, maybe all I knew was that I might go to hell if I don't. Did I really understand what I was doing? Did I know why I did it? Did I have a good comprehension of the plan of salvation? And was I mature enough? to follow through with that commitment. Now, if you can't answer any of those in the affirmative, then you think to yourself and you answer for yourself, is this something I need to reevaluate? And now that I do know those things, do I need to be baptized correctly for the remission of sins with the knowledge of knowing full well what I'm doing? And so that's only something. This question is only can only be answered by the individual. We give these guidelines and principles which might govern that decision, but only the individual can answer that question for themselves based on these principles from Scripture. We now look at a second question to address today in our Bible question and answer series. And as always, if you're just joining us, you'd like to submit a question to be answered on our program. You can email us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can visit our website thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and you can fill out a form and we will answer those questions on our program. Now to the next question. I often hear people, the viewer says, I often hear people talk about the security of the believer. When asking about this, they would say that a Christian does not have to worry about being lost because once he's saved, he can never be lost. Is this doctrine true according to the Scriptures? And so we have this sometimes referred to in different ways. Some people would call this the security of the believer. Others would call it as once saved, always saved, or you can't fall from grace. Basically, when I become a Christian, some would teach and say, you can never so sin as to be eternally lost. Well, friend, what we're asking today is, is that doctrine true? Is it the case that when I become a Christian, I can never be lost? Well, friend, you clearly, you clearly find in the Bible, listen real carefully now, you clearly and explicitly find in the Bible that even though I am a Christian, if I live in sin and die in sin, the Bible says I absolutely can and will be lost. The idea of once saved, always saved, that's not taught in the Bible. In fact, I want to show you from the language that sometimes false teachers use that this doctrine is not true. Look in Galatians chapter 5 and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 4. Galatians chapter 5, I want you to look with me at verse number 4. Sometimes we say you can't fall from grace. Look how God addresses that idea. The Bible says in Galatians 5 verse 4, You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, watch this now, you have fallen from grace. Paul's writing to the church in Galatia, Galatians 1 verses 1 and 2. He's writing to people who are Christians and he says to those Christians, you've become cut off. The idea is severed. You've become severed from Christ. Why? You attempt to be justified by law. Here's the problem. Some of these Christians are now propagating the idea that you've got to be a Christian and you've got to follow the law of Moses. And so Paul's saying to those of you who are Christians and who are attempting to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now, keep in mind this. A Christian can't attempt to be justified by the law of God. When a Christian does that, he falls from grace. Therefore, a Christian can fall from grace. Now, the wording there, fall from grace, some would say, well, that just carries the idea that grace is in the center and you've just moved a little further. No. The literal language of the New Testament there is, you have fallen ek, out of grace. 
you were in the grace of God, you attempted to go back or now espousing a false law system and a false doctrine, you're out of God's grace. And so think about this with me. Man says you can't fall from grace. To Christians, God said you already have fallen from grace. Some of them were so entrenched in sin, they were no longer in the grace of God and they would indeed be lost. Now, let me give you another example. In Acts chapter 8, there is a man by the name of Simon the sorcerer. Simon hears the preaching of the gospel. Simon obeys that message. He himself is baptized. And as a result, the Bible says he obeyed the gospel. He became a Christian. He's a child of God. The Bible says he was baptized and he's now walking and worshiping with the saints. But a problem arises. Acts chapter 8 verse 18, Simon who in his former life was a trickster or a magician, he now sees that through the laying on the apostles' hands, uh, the gifts of the Spirit can be given. And he says, I'll give you money if you give me that gift also. What does Peter say to Simon who is a Christian? Listen to Acts chapter 8, and, and I don't want you to miss these words. If you got your Bible, I want you to see it for yourself. Look at this is the clearest passage to teach that a child of God can so sin as to be lost. Look in Acts chapter 8, verse number 20. Peter said to him, Watch this now, your money perish with what? With you. Because you thought that the gift of God should be purchased with money. Peter clearly said to Simon, your money is going to perish with you. What did Peter say? Simon, you're lost. You're going to perish and your money's going to perish. Why would Peter say that? Your heart's not right in the sight of God. Peter would go on to say, you've got neither part nor portion in this matter. Repent and pray to God that the evil thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Simon had to repent. He needed to be forgiven of something. And friend, that clearly implies sin. God is of pure eyes that behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness. Habakkuk 1, 12 and 13. Sin separates a man from God. Therefore, Simon was in sin. He was separated from God and he was in a lost or perishing state. And so the idea that once you become a Christian, you can never so sin as to be lost, Friend, that's false doctrine. That's not true. You find the exact opposite of that being taught in the Bible. Now, let me share with you one other passage with which great clarity, which shows with great clarity that this idea is not true. 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter is writing to certain Christians who have gone back to the world who have left Christ, and I want you to listen to how he describes their state now. 2 Peter 2, verse number 20. Peter says of those who have gone back to the world, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is, they've obeyed the gospel, they're Christians, they've now gone back into sin. If after that they've escaped, they are again entangled in them and overcome. Now, don't miss this. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Why? It would have been better for them, those who had not, it would have been better had they not known the way of truth, way of righteousness, than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it's happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now here's the questions to consider. How is it the case that the latter end is worse for them than the beginning? How's it worse now for them than before they even obeyed the gospel? Here's how. Because they were Christians. Because they at one time had salvation. They were at one time in Christ. Now, not only are they back lost in sin, now they know what they've lost. Now they know what it means to be saved. Now they have willfully denied the teaching of God and of Christ. Now look again at verse number 22. Here's how God describes this picture. What's it like when a Christian gets caught up in sin and goes back into the world? It's like a dog returning to his own vomit. It's disgusting. It's like a, a, a pig having been washed returns to the muck and mire. It's dirty. God clearly, and there are, there are a host of passages, not just these three, but there are a host of passages which clearly teach a child of God can sow sin 
as to be lost and separate from God. And so to answer the question, is the security of the believer a Bible teaching? Friend, it absolutely is not. The Bible teaches I must fight the good fight every day. 1 Timothy chapter 6. The Bible teaches I must be faithful unto death. Revelation 2 verse 10. And the Bible teaches we must make our calling and election sure. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse number 10. We now turn our attention to another question that has been asked. And this indeed is a very good question, very relevant to a lot of us today as we live in the world and we have to hear stuff of the world. Here's what our viewer writes. He says, I work in a factory and many of the people I work with claim to be Christians. However, most of them curse or use bad language. Can you give me some Bible verses that teach about cursing and bad language and how a Christian should talk? Well, friend, we absolutely can because the Bible clearly teaches that foul language, that uh, cursing, that language like unto that is not something a Christian should do. I cannot claim to be a faithful Christian and bad words be coming out of my mouth left and right. That's not the way a, a Christian ought to do. Now, how do we know that? Listen to these Bible verses with me. Look in Colossians chapter 3. What does the Bible teach about cursing and things like unto that? I want you to notice what Colossians chapter 3 Verse number 8 will say on this subject. Colossians 3, that's verse number 8. The Bible says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language out of your mouth. How's a Christian put off filthy language out of your mouth? Listen to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse number 29, the Bible says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, or let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Colossians 4 verse 6, Let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23 verse 7, We'll give an account for every idle word we speak. Matthew 12, verse 37 following. And so these are scriptures to think about as it relates to the subject of cursing or filthy language. The Bible says don't let it come out of your mouth. The Bible says that's not the way a Christian himself ought to talk. Another question that we want to address today is this. Someone writes, My mom believes that it does not matter what you believe or teach, that everyone is going to be saved. What does the Bible say about this? Well, friend, this all accepting, everybody's going to be saved, regardless of how immoral or what you believe ideology, is extremely popular today. Uh, but is it biblical? Does the Bible teach, regardless of what you believe, everybody's going to be okay? My well, friend, Jesus did not teach that. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said the opposite of that. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's not enough to just say you believe in Christ. It's not enough just to acknowledge certain things. To go to heaven and to be saved, Jesus said you've got to do what he says. Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus asked this question, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? It, these people are calling Christ Lord. They recognize His power. They see His majesty. No doubt some of them have seen the miracles, and they say, Lord, Lord. And then they go and do what they want or what somebody else teaches. Jesus said those two ideas are not compatible. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's not enough just to believe whatever. Everybody who believes something is not going to be saved. Just because you claim to be a Christian isn't enough. In fact, did you know that Jesus taught that the majority of people are not going to be saved? Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to eternal destruction. 
and many there are who go down it. But difficult is the gate, and restricted is the path that leads to eternal life, and few there are who find it. Jesus was not in this ecumenical accepting everybody, just as long as you believe something about Christ, everybody's going to be saved camp. Jesus said, you've got to do what I say to be saved. You've got to follow me. You've got to live for me each and every day to be saved. Then another question that we want to address today is this. Here's our next question. We have friends who are branches off of uh, the Mormon church, and they believe in polygamy. Is polygamy sinful in the Bible? Well, friend, we know all the way back to the Old Testament that it was never God's will for kings to multiply their wives. Deuteronomy 17 verse 17, God said that the kings should not multiply their wives or horses or whatever it may be. They weren't to have a number of those. That was never God's divine will. To understand uh, about the subject of polygamy and marriage, we need to go back to the original plan and pattern of God. And friend, that plan and pattern is in Genesis chapter 2. God created one man, Adam, and one woman, Eve. And Genesis 2.24 says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What's God's original pattern? God didn't create Adam and Eve and Barbara. God created Adam and Eve. And God said, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, not wives, and the two, not three, four, five, and six, shall become one flesh. One man, one woman for life. That's God's original paradigm, His original uh, plan for marriage. And of course we know that's still in existence today. Matthew 19 verses 1 through 6, Jesus quotes Genesis 2.24 as it relates to divorce and remarriage. And He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. What God has joined together, let not man separate. And so that plan, that original pattern, is still in place today. One man, one woman for life. Now, here's a passage for you to consider as it relates to the uh, singularity, one man and one woman for marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I want to direct your attention to what the Apostle Paul says in verse number 2. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want you to notice what Paul says in verse number 2. He says, Nevertheless, and the question is, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? And Paul says in verse number 2, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, listen to this, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So the church in Corinth, they write to Paul and they've got questions related to marriage and sexual relations and, and in answer to that question, Paul says, here's God's plan. Let each man have his own wives. Well, that's not what he said. Let each husband, let each uh, wife have her own husbands. No, not what it says. Let each man have his own wife. Let each wife have her own husband. The singularity of marriage. One man, one woman for life. That's the plan that you find in the New Testament. And friend, God does not condone, God does not authorize, and the Scriptures definitely do not promote polygamy anywhere in the Bible. You know, sometimes I, I, I've seen, been flipping through the channels, and I see uh, a reality show where you've got some man, a Mormon background, he's got all these wives, and you know, what, you know why those shows are popular? Because of all the drama. Somebody's fighting. Somebody's upset because they didn't get enough of his attention. Who got to sleep with him last night? Who's the favorite wife? And you've got four or five women with one man. That's just not going to work very well. It doesn't take a whole lot of common sense to realize those kind of relationships are not going to end well. And more importantly, the Scripture teaches that's not according to the will of God. When God set the pattern, one man, one woman for life, that was the final pattern that God Himself did set. Another question we want to answer today is, someone writes in and says, I often see the Ten Commandments at public buildings, and I have friends who believe that we should keep the Ten Commandments today. Are the Ten Commandments binding today on Christians? Now friend, when you go back to Exodus chapter 20 and you read those Ten Commandments, Jesus did mention many of those under the new law. 
but is the Ten Commandments of Moses, is the Old Testament, is the Sabbath day binding on Christians today? I want you to listen to the words of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, as we address this question. That's Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says of Christ, He Himself is our peace, who has made both one, Jew and Gentile, has broken down the middle wall of separation, now watch this, having abolished in His flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in Himself one new man from the two, thus making, uh, thus making one man, one new body as it were. And so when we think about the Ten Commandments, Jesus on the cross abolished that. Hebrews 8 verse 13, in that He says a new covenant. He's made the first obsolete. Ten Commandments are part of the old covenant, part of the first covenant, and that's not something the Christian is going to be judged by today. When I stand before God, am I going to be judged by the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses? Listen to the words of Jesus in John 12, 48. Jesus said, He who rejects me does not receive my words, has that which judges him. What is it, Lord? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And so while the Ten Commandments was a good law, holy law, a right law, it was given specifically to the Israelites. The law of Christ and the new covenant is what we're under today. And as we said, nine out of those Ten Commandments have been brought back under, under the teaching of Jesus. But today we don't worship on the Sabbath. We worship on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us today for our Bible question and answer series. If you have a question you'd like to submit, we'd love for you to do that. You can email us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can fill out our form on our website, thegospelofchrist.com slash questions. And as always, our desire and our prayer for every person is that we will turn our attention to the Word and will of God with a humble heart, we'll submit to God's will and that we will obey the gospel of Christ and live in such a way that God receives the honor and the glory from my life and from yours. May God bless each of us as we strive to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.